All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I know we've got a lot of faces on the other end of the computer. Um, I'm, I'm, my name is Marcy Stagner. If we haven't met, though, I think I probably know everybody on here. It's, it's weird because I can't see your faces so much. Um, I'm the Program Director of Cultural Arts and Adult Services at the Memphis Jewish Community Center. And we are very excited about this, about today's installment for uh, Lit Fest Live in your living room with uh, Bill Haltom, who is going to be interviewed by Jossie Wurzberg. And I just wanna take a moment to thank our partner for this event, uh, the Memphis, the Jewish Historical Society of Memphis and the Mid-South. So thank you so much. Mimi Clemens from JHS is going to be doing the introduction. So welcome Mimi, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Marcy. The JHS is, is very, very excited to partner with the Jewish Community Center's Literary and Cultural Arts Series to present this interesting and timely program. As you said, I'm Mimi Clemens. I'm past president and a board member of the JHS. And I hope you will all visit our website at jhsmem.org, become a member, get on our mail and email list, and learn more about upcoming programs. It's my real honor today to introduce our, introduce our speaker and my friend, Bill Halton. Bill has been an attorney in Memphis for over 40 years, primarily defending physicians in medical facilities. He's well known and respected as both a superb trial lawyer and a teller of fascinating stories. Over the course of his career, Bill has written a total of eight books on topics ranging from humor to law to politics, and sometimes all of the above in the same book. Bill has been a newspaper and magazine columnist for over 25 years and currently writes for the USA Today Nashville Network. He has served as chair of the editorial boards for four magazines, and has, including the ABA Journal, which is the flagship publication of the American Bar Association. And he has had a longstanding column in the Tennessee Bar Journal popular speaker, Bill has been the featured speaker at commencements, conventions, banquets, and leadership seminars across the country. In the 20 years I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Bill Haltom, I have never had a conversation with him that was not punctuated with the familiar, I've got a great story about that. His stories are legend and his point of view is always straightforward and heartfelt. Be glad you were not an opposing attorney because he always had the jury eating right out of his hand. In his current book, Why Can't Mother Vote? Joseph Hanover and the Unfinished Business of Democracy, Bill takes us into the final moments of the many years long struggle to grant the right to vote to women. He introduces us to the unsung hero, a young Memphian, Joseph Hanover, a Jewish immigrant and state representative who plays a critical role in getting us over the finish line. Bill would be quick to tell you that it was his friend, another prominent Memphis attorney, Jocelyn Dan Wurzberg, who encouraged him to write this book. So it seems only right that Jocelyn is here today to discuss the book with Bill. Jocelyn Wurzberg is a fifth generation Memphian who has dedicated her life's work to civil rights, women's rights, and social justice activities in the fields of law, housing, and employment in Memphis and beyond, propelled into action by the assassination of Martin Luther King in Memphis. Jocelyn founded several important civil rights organizations, and she has also served on the Social Action Commission of Reform Judaism, President Gerald Ford's International Women's Year Commission, and Governor Winfield Dunn's Human Rights Commission, where she wrote Tennessee's first anti-discrimination law in employment, public accommodations, and housing. Jocelyn has had a long and distinguished career as a mediator in Memphis and family law settings and is a founding member of the Mediation Association of Tennessee, the Association for Women Attorneys, and has held pivotal roles in many local and national organizations committed to mediation, law, and civil, civil rights. We are privileged to have Bill Haltom here today to discuss his fascinating book with Jossie Wurzberg facilitating our discussion. So I'll turn it over to Bill and Jossie now and thank you all for being here. 
Can I add real quick before we get started, I do want to mention that at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat button. If you have questions along the way, please add them in there and we will get to those questions. So just at the bottom of your screen, the chat button, that's where you can submit some questions, any questions that you have, and we'll get to those too. Thank you so much, Mimi. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you both. For years now, Bill, you have treated the bench in the bar mag with your humorous columns in the Tennessee Bar Magazine and the Nashville Tennessean. And then you switched to serious biographies, one of Senator Howard Baker, the iconic coach Pat Summit, well, the not so serious fictional character Hamilton Berger of Perry Mason thing. But now you have written a biography on Memphian Joe Hanover. What inspired you to start writing biographies? Well, thank you, Joss. And first of all, let me just say too, that I wanna thank Mimi Clemens, my dear friend, Mimi, who I worked with for years defending innocent positions uh, in this city. And I wanna thank her for that very nice introduction. And Joss, it's just a joy to, to be, be with you. There's a short answer to that question about what inspired me to write, uh, I just happen to have a copy of this book here, <laughs> to write about uh, Joe Hanover. The answer is actually who, and it's you, Johnson, you know that. What happened was uh, uh, a couple of years ago when I had written my book uh, about the great Pat Summit uh, called Full Court Press, how Pat Summit and a legal team changed the game. It's about the Tennessee basket, women's basketball coach who uh, early in her career back in the 70s was uh, an expert witness in a Title IX lawsuit that allowed uh, uh, women in Tennessee to play the full court game. They had been restricted. People like my wife and Jossie couldn't let, wouldn't be allowed to run the full court uh, before this lawsuit years ago. So I was having a signing at, at Novel Bookstore and Jossie came up to me and Jossie and Paula Casey, my dear friends came up to me afterwards said, we know what your next book is gonna be. And I said, well, that's interesting because I have no idea. And they said, well, you need to write the story of, of Joe Hanover, the unsung hero of women's suffrage. And I, I spent a few weeks studying this. Uh, I went out to, uh, I, I called uh, Eddie Kaplan, who I think is on the uh, call today, uh, uh, the, the link today, uh, the nephew of uh, Joe. I went out to Temple Israel and, uh, and uh, uh, Micah Greenstein opened up the library there and all sorts of information. And I just said, Jossie, I said, this is an incredible story because it's the story of an unsung hero of women's suffrage in Tennessee. A Polish immigrant who came to Memphis in, in 1895, and we'll get to this story in a few minutes here. And I also was inspired to write this because even though the victory for women's suffrage, the passage of the 19th Amendment in Tennessee 100 years ago, happened a century ago, it's still a highly timely, relevant story today. Because as I say in the title of the book, The Unfinished Business of Democracy, Joe Hanover believed that democracy was a work in progress and that winning the women vote in, in 1920 was a step, but that battle, as we know, goes on to, the battle for the vote goes on to this day. So that's what inspired me. You inspired me to write it, Jossie, and, 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 and the story inspired me to go forward. Well, tell us about Joe. Tell us about his rearing, his education, his vocation, and how did he get to Memphis, Tennessee? It's a great story, thank you. Joe Hanover was born in Paul Tusk, Poland, in 1899, the third son of Wolf and Esther Hanover. They were Orthodox Jews in Poland. And at that time, the Tsar of Russia controlled Poland. He persecuted the Jewish people. Uh, in the early 1890s, he confiscated all the Hanover, Hanover's property. And so uh, Wolf Hanover decided he was gonna find a new home for the Hanover family. And he first made the journey around 1893, leaving the courageous Esther Hanover, uh, uh, Joe's mother, and Joe and his brothers back in Poltusk, Poland. Uh, Wolf made the journey from Poland to, uh, uh, to London, to New York, to St. Louis, and to eventually to Memphis, eventually to Binghampton, uh, which at that time was not a part of the city. It was a little community outside the, the city. And he got a job first as a, as a peddler. Uh, his cousin David was, was here and had made the journey from Poland before and, and uh, and inspired him to come to, to Memphis and to Binghampton. And he moved from there into dry goods and uh, found a new home for, uh, for Esther and his boys. He was sending money, somehow getting money back to Poland for a couple of years. By 1895, Wolf had sent the sum, well, he sent four steamship tickets uh, in steerage for Esther and the boys. 
and had sent the sum of $500 to pay a bootlegger, not a liquor bootlegger like in Tennessee, but a people bootlegger in Poland to get the Hanover family out of Poland. And on a winter night in 1895, Joe Hanover, it's one of his earliest memories in life. He was only five years old. And it was a memory of cold and darkness because you see young Joe Hanover, the bootlegger put young Joe in his knapsack on his back and walked young Joe across a frozen lake in Poland, carried him across a frozen lake in Poland with Esther and the two other boys behind them with, uh, with her holding their hands. Uh, Esther had a wig atop her head. In the wig was a little bit of money that she had left at that time uh, uh, for the journey. She had a piece of salami in her stocking to feed the boys on the ship. They managed, the bootlegger earned his $500. He got them out of Poland. They got on the ship. Then Joe had a pleasant memory. It was an unpleasant memory uh, for uh, Esther. Uh, she was seasick during most of the voyage down in steerage. One night uh, she was trying to get some sleep and they were tossed around and Joe's brothers were asleep and young Joe uh, made his way up to the top of the of the, of the ship, the steerage, the top of this way, the top of the steerage, where there was an orchestra playing and first class passengers were dancing. And young Joe got up on the stage and began to dance for the crowd. And they loved him so much, they began to throw money uh, up to the stage. And Joe took his cap off and collected all the money. And when they got through Ellis Island a few weeks later, uh, that money paid for train tickets from, from, from New York City to Memphis, where they were met up with, uh, with uh, their new home, with, uh, with Wolf Hanover. And uh, if you go to the restaurant, Bounty on Broad in Binghampton, that is the Hanover home. It says on the top of the building, it says Hanover inscribed there in the brick. And, uh, and they lived, the WC Hanover and Sons was on the first floor and, uh, and uh, the Hanovers lived on the second floor, which leads, uh, uh, you talked about his education, Jossie, and I, I don't mean to rush ahead, but, uh, but uh, it leads to the question, why can't mother vote? Because you see what happened was the Hanovers loved their new country. They were deeply patriotic. In 1901, Wolf and Esther became citizens of the United States of America. They had to go to criminal court in Memphis uh, because they were from Poland and they had to actually uh, swear that they were not uh, loyal to the Tsar of Russia. They had no trouble making, making that uh, oath at all. They became mm -hmm. citizens and they told uh, Esther and Wolf told the boys we're living in the greatest country on the face of the earth. We can worship where we choose to worship. We can work where we choose to work. There is no czar to take away our property and you need to read the American documents. We want you to read the constitution. We want you to read the bill of rights. Young Joe read these by a kerosene lamp on the second floor of uh, that home where Bounty on Broad is now located. One night he asked his parents a question. He said, having read the bill of rights, he said, uh, well, I, there's something I don't understand. Why can't mother vote? Why can't mother vote? And he didn't get a direct answer to that question at that time. As his life went by, he began to get an answer to that question. And at some time in our discussions, I'll tell you eventually what his answer was and what he did in the process. Jossie, you want to jump back in? <laughs> well, he did become a lawyer. Want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, he went to, uh, he, actually he dropped out of school after the eighth grade because of the fact that he was a working class kid and working class kids had to work. <laughs> and uh, at that point, he was working full time for W.C. Hanover and Sons on the first floor there on, on Broad Avenue in Binghampton. But in 1911, he started going to Knight Law School at the Southern Law School, which eventually became what is now the University of Memphis Law School. Mm -hmm. In 1914, he uh, got his law degree and passed the Tennessee bar became a lawyer, got his first job as uh, the city attorney for Binghampton, which was a separate municipality at that time, and started his legal career at that time and, uh, and was very proud. He really believed very much, as we'll talk some more about, he believed in democracy. He believed in the rule of law. Reading those documents that Esther and Wolf wanted their sons to read, that's when he really began to believe it. That's why he decided he wanted to be a lawyer and it eventually led to him wanting to carry on a fight uh, uh, as a lawyer, as a lawmaker. Well, tell us about his ambition of getting into politics and share some of the political dynamics that were going on at that time. Well, that's it's an interesting time. Uh, in 1918, uh, young Joe Hanover, young lawyer, uh, just uh, four years into his law practice, 
decided that he uh, wanted to go to lawmaker. He wanted to go. He wanted to be a lawmaker. He had not forgotten uh, some of the questions he had asked his parents about the rule of law in this country and, and who could vote and who couldn't vote. And uh, that was his ambition was to do that. Now, some of you may have heard a man of a man named Boss Crump, Edward Hall Crump. In 1918, Edward Hall Crump controlled Memphis politics. He controlled Tennessee politics pretty much. And to get elected to office uh, in, in 1918 in Memphis, you pretty much had to be a Democrat. And you had to be not just a Democrat, but a Crump Democrat. Interestingly enough, Joe Hanover did not like Boss Crump and made no secret of how he felt about Boss Crump. He actually said, my family and I left Poland to escape a tyrant, the Tsar of Russia, and Boss Crump is a tyrant in Memphis. He actually said this about Boss Crump. Uh, you can imagine how that, that went over. He filed to run as an independent. No one expected Joe Hanover to be elected to the legislature in the fall of 1918. Probably Joe didn't expect it. Boss Crump certainly didn't expect it. But when the votes were counted, all these fellow immigrants in the Pinch District, all these fellow immigrants uh, from uh, in Binghampton, they elected Joe to Nashville. They elected Joe to the state legislature. And Joe made the journey in, in January of 1919 to Nashville to take his seat in the legislature. And Jossie, you know the story. What was the first bill he introduced? He introduced a bill for partial suffrage, not total suffrage, but partial suffrage. You see, at the time, Carrie Chapman Catt, who was president of the National Women's Suffrage Association, she had a strategy, kind of a two-pronged strategy. They're going to try to get a constitutional amendment. They're trying, to, they're going to try to get full votes for women. But in the meantime, they were going to go state by state and at least see if they could get partial suffrage. And Joe got a bill passed, on, got a law passed on that so that his mother and other women could vote. But it was, first of all, it was kind of a separate but equal ballot. They couldn't even vote in the same ballot precincts as, as Joe's father and the men voted. And second, they could only vote for a limited number of offices. They certainly couldn't vote for president of the United States. They couldn't vote for the electors for president, but just a limited number. But he got that, he got that passed. He got that passed. And the next step, of course, was going to be trying to get full suffrage. In the spring of 1919, excuse me, 19, uh, yeah, 1919, uh, Joe came back home. The session was over. Now, in those days, from what I understand, uh, the legislature only met every other year. Now, I am tempted to make an editorial comment at this point about how we should return to that idea, but I'm going to refrain from, 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 from that, okay, because this is a bipartisan uh, 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 presentation we're making today. But in, in the spring of 1919, the legislature adjourned. They were not scheduled to return again until 1921 after the 1920 election. And Joe wasn't even sure he was ever going back. He came back to Memphis and got a new job as an assistant city attorney in Memphis. Binghampton then become part of, 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 of the city of Memphis. And he got a job as an assistant city attorney. And at that point, however, it was interesting uh, what happened. Maybe Boss Crump got a little bit of revenge. Uh, the word got to, uh, to Joe that he was going to have to give up his seat in the legislature because the, because of a Tennessee law at the time, you couldn't hold both a, two government jobs. You couldn't be a city attorney and, and assistant city attorney and also a legislator. So Joe was told uh, after he got the job as an assistant city attorney, you, 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 you're, 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 you forfeited your seat in the legislature. You know what Joe did? He didn't even respond because he wasn't even sure he was going to go back. He didn't know there was going to be any other work to be done. And then we know what began to happen. What began to happen was the course of history. In the fall of 1919, the United States Congress finally, finally passed, a, passed the 19th Amendment. Now, it didn't pass the amendment, but the 19th Amendment finally giving women uh, 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 the, the vote, which they should have had since the beginning of the Republic. And, uh, and they submitted that proposed 19th Amendment to the states for ratification. Now. To be ratified as a part of the Constitution, the 19th Amendment had to be uh, ratified by three quarters of the states. There were 48 states at that time, so 36 states had to pass it. And in the fall of 1919, the states began to act on this. The first week after Congress did this, uh, eight states passed it very quickly. Boom, boom. It looked like it was going to just quickly become a part of the Constitution of the United States. And Joe was in Memphis watching this not knowing that destiny was gonna have him a role uh, in this in the summer of 1920. Uh, 
by the spring of 1920, uh, as states voted, legislators, legislatures voted on this, they began to appear it was still going to pass. And then the governor of Louisiana decided he's going to speak out against this. And he basically said, he played the race card. He said, this is a white man's country and we cannot give women the vote because if we do, we know who's going to want to vote next. And all we believe in in the South will be will be gone. After he made that clarion call, seven Southern states rejected the proposed amendment. One after one after one after one. By, the, by June of 1920, the ratification, 35 states had, had, had ratified it. They needed one more state, but it was all coming down to Delaware or Tennessee. I don't mean there were other states that might vote after that, they had voted some states that had passed it were even considering rescinding it. Ohio was talking about having a special legislative session uh, to rescind it. So it came down to Tennessee. In June of 1920, Delaware voted no. So it all comes down to the volunteer state. Now Joe's back in Memphis. He's, he loves his new job as an assistant city attorney. And, uh, and but then the word goes out that we might have a special session of the legislature in Tennessee to be the last state to vote on whether to ratify this. Now, uh, uh, the governor of Tennessee, Governor Roberts, was he was straddling the fence on this one. He did not want to call a special session. He had no idea what the impact might, might be on him. He was getting pressure from both sides, including from the National Democratic Party with the uh, upcoming presidential election of 1920. Uh, and finally, in July of 1920, he he, he said he would call a special session. Now, what about Joe? The Attorney General of Tennessee had ruled that Joe's seat was, was, was vacated. He didn't have a seat in the legislature anymore. And they were gonna have a special election to determine who's gonna fill Joe's seat. What did Joe do? Well, Joe stepped down from his position as an assistant city attorney in Memphis, a plum job he loved. He filed a run for the office that he had forfeited. And guess, guess who got elected for that seat? Joe got elected. Yeah. Well, you know, um, until Carolyn Yellen and Dr. Jan Sherman wrote, and our dear friend Paula Casey published the book, The Perfect 36, and until now, reading your biography, I wasn't really aware of Joe Hanover's contribution for women gaining the right to vote. Now, we all heard about this Harry Burns mother writing him a, a letter that right before the vote, he, he changed it to please his mother. Um, but Joe Hanover's role seems much more heroic and yet it was so unappreciated until now. Um, share with us what happened, it, it's exciting. And by the way, I really appreciate you mentioning uh, Carol, Carol uh, rest herself, Carol Lynn Yellen and, and, and Jan Sherman and Paula and that wonderful book that uh, they, they, they uh, that they published many years ago, uh, um, and uh, you're right. Uh, uh, Joe has mentioned, but he, I think he, some of the first people he mentioned were Carol, Jan, and, and Paula. Uh, and uh, he's kind of forgotten here on this story, but here's what happened. What happened was Joe got elected to the legislature, uh, to, uh, to his seat. Uh, in August of 1920, Joe got on a train in Memphis, headed to Union Station in Nashville, and he checked in to the Hermitage Hotel. Now, the Hermitage Hotel was, uh, was regarded then, there were three houses of the legislature. There was the state senate, the state house, and the Hermitage, the lobby of the Hermitage Hotel, okay? Because, seriously, and uh, I'm wearing a yellow rose today because this was the, what the national media called the Battle of the Roses. Because when all of these uh, legislators checked into the Hermitage Hotel, and, uh, and the proponents of suffrage wore yellow roses. The opponents, the antis, we had the suffs versus the antis. The suffs were the yellow roses. The antis versus wore the red roses. And the same time that Joe checked into the hotel for the session, two women checked into the hotel for very different reasons. One was Carrie Chapman Catt. Carrie Chapman Catt, president of the two million member strong National Women's Suffrage Association. In 1901, Susan B. Anthony had hand-picked Carrie Chapman Catt to be president of the association and to lead the fight. 
she checked in to the hermitage, got a room on the third floor, and she was there because it was because a battle that went all the way to Abigail Adams writing a letter to her husband in 1776 saying, don't forget the women, uh, uh, to, 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 to Seneca Falls, uh, all the way, years, women had, women had marched, women had been in prison, women had suffered, and now Carrie Chapman Cat could see the victory coming in Tennessee. But at the same time that woman checked in, a Red Rose woman checked in. Her name was Josephine Anderson Pearson. Josephine Anderson Pearson was uh, uh, a seminarian, a minister. She was from Mont Eagle, Tennessee. Uh, and uh, she was president of the association opposed to women's suffrage. She was, she, as, an, as an evangelical Christian, she thought that it was contrary to the Bible for women uh, to vote or to have that kind of role. It would, it would make, that would just change their whole role. Families would be destroyed, she said, if we had, if we had this. And so she checked into the hotel to lead the fight against it. Other interesting forces checked into the hotel, Jossie. Jack Daniels checked into the hotel. Well, not Jack himself, but on the eighth floor of the Hermitage Hotel was the Jack Daniels Suite. And the Jack Daniels Suite was where legislators could relax, enjoy a little Jack Daniels, even during prohibition. And, uh, and hear what the Jack Daniels people had, lobbyists had to say about it, which they thought that women's suffrage would be a terrible disaster for. There was a strange unholy alliance between Josephine Pearson and the Women's Christian Temperance Union and Jack Daniels opposed to this. The Onion Railroad sent their lobbyists fiercely opposed to this. And, uh, and when they all arrived, the lobbyists, uh, uh, the, the legislators, the yellow rose wearing suffs, the anti-rose wearing, uh, the anti-red, uh, was initially thought that uh, this was gonna pass. There were 62 committed votes in the House to pass, of the 99 members of the House. The Senate was overwhelmingly in favor. And then something happened. Seth Walker, the most powerful member of the Tennessee legislature, called his colleagues into his office in the Capitol and said the same thing the governor of Louisiana had said. He said, this is a white man's country. This is a white man's country. And everything we fought for, everything we worked for after Reconstruction, everything we worked for for the lost cause since eight, 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 after 1876, it's all on the line now, guys. And overnight, the 62 committed votes fell to 55, and they kept falling, and eventually fell to 47. At least two to three votes shy of what they needed. Um, and at that point, Joe got a call. Uh, a call he was not expecting. The call was from Carrie Chapman Cat. Joe had been part of a group that met at night uh, in Carrie Chapman's Cat Suite on the third floor of the Hermitage and discussed strategy. And uh, Carrie Cat, Chapman Cat, the canvassing real, revealed they were, they were losing this battle now. They were losing this battle. And remember, he came down to Tennessee. No telling when this thing would have passed. You know, we, we've been, Josh, how long have we been waiting for the Equal Rights Amendment to pass? Uh -huh. <laughs> we were waiting 50 years for that. Right. So, so, but, but this was seriously, it was on the line. It wasn't like another state the next month was going to pass it. So uh, uh, the votes began to, to fall apart. And Carrie Chapman Cat one night said to Joe Hanover, I want you to lead the legislative fight on the floor of the House to get ratification passed. Now, Joe is frankly probably surprised by this request uh, because, you know, on the political face of it, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Here was Joe Hanover the only independent member of the legislature, the only Jewish member of the legislature, I think there's one, excuse me, I think there's one of, one of two Jews in the legislature, uh, uh, a, a city lawyer in a rural dominated legislature. On the face of it, it didn't make a lot of sense. But Carrie Chapman Cat knew two things about Joe Hanover. Number one, she knew there was no more passionate voice in the Tennessee legislature for women's suffrage than Joe Hanover. It was his cause, it was his cause. Number two, equally important, she knew something very important about Joe as a legislator. She knew in just the year he had been up there, Joe had won the enormous respect of both sides of the aisle in the legislature. The word was, he had this city lawyer from Memphis, and the word was that if you want a bill written, you want a resolution written, and a lot of these rural legislators, city legislators too, had no, didn't have the legal ability to, to draft these things. They said, go see Joe Hanover from Memphis. Joe, Joe will write it for you, and Joe would. He was writing legislation for Democrats, writing legislation for Republicans, and everybody admired him. Everybody liked Joe Hanover. 
And so Kerry Chapman Cat said, I want you to lead the fight. Joe agreed to do it. Uh, he paid a he paid a huge price. Not long after uh, it was announced that he was going to lead the fight and the word got out, he was attacked one night in the elevator of the Hermitage Hotel by two men. One calling him a Bolshevik, the other calling him a, quote, kite. Beat him. Uh, he survived it, but the governor of Tennessee uh, uh, got him a bodyguard uh, from the National Police Force the next day. Joe said he didn't need one. He did need one. Uh, the night, the National Police Officer, Officer Paul Bush, accompanied Joe for the rest of the rest of the session. Joe didn't eat. He lost 20 pounds during the session. He developed an ulcer. He couldn't sleep at night. He couldn't sleep at night because he was either you're getting calls from men threatening his life or calls from cooing women claiming they wanted to come spend some time with him there in his room at that hour, three in the morning or whatever, to help him with the fight. He knew that was a setup. So he led the fight. Uh, bribes were taking place. One of my favorite stories is that one of the young, uh, legis one of his young friends, rural legislator friends, came to one day and he said, hey, Joe, I know you, I promised to vote for suffrage, but they've just offered me, the antis have just offered me $500 for my vote. And Joe said, they're taking you for a ride. The going rate is a thousand. <laughs> and and uh, the, his colleague in the legislature was so offended. He said, they don't respect me, do they, Joe? And he said, no, they don't respect you at all. And Joe, uh, Joe saved that I vote. Suffrage. Mm -hmm. So then, Jossie, we come down to uh, to the events of two days, two memorable days in, Amer in Tennessee history, in American history, well, August 17th and August 18th. On August 17th, 1920, the last debate took place uh, before the vote in the legislature. Seth Walker, the Speaker of the Tennessee House, the most powerful legislator there, who had uh, become the biggest opponent of suffrage, uh, he handed the speaker's gavel to the speaker pro tem so he could go down to the well of the house to make the final speech against the proposed ratification of the 19th Amendment. Uh, and he said, again, the same words. He said, he, he said, he said, this is a spiritual issue. It's a white man's country. He held up a telegram reportedly from the quote, colored lady, covered colored ladies voters of Los Angeles, begging the legislature to pass this so that they could get the vote as well. And he held it up and said, this is out outrageous outrageous after he spoke time for the final speaker in the debate and who spoke joe hanover spoke now mimi mentioned that one thing that we lawyers can do and she flattered me by saying i'm good at doing it but i, I, I appreciated that we lawyers are good at telling stories <laughs> and i don't mean fibbing i mean i mean stories that that inspire people stories that move people, stories that move juries, stories that move judges. And Joe Hanover that day told a story. You know what story he told? He told his story. He told a story about crossing that frozen lake in Poland in the knapsack of a bootlegger. He told the story about coming to this country. He told the story about being told by his parents how blessed they were to be there. He told a deeply patriotic story of how much he loved this country. And then he had a remarkable line. He said, I want to remind you that all of us here today crossed the seas to be here. You may not have crossed the seas like I did, Joe said, uh, uh, you know, because he was the only, quote, immigrant in the legislature. And of course, we're all immigrants, as you know, but he was the only one not born, born on American soil. And he said, uh, uh, it may have been your grandfather, your great grandfather, your grandmother, uh, but we crossed the seas to get here. We crossed the seas to get here. And he said, we should now make democracy real. We should make democracy real for everyone by ratifying the 19th Amendment. And then they adjourned for the day. Joe went back to uh, the Hermitage Hotel. They had another strategy meeting with Kerry Chapman Catt. They canvassed and Kerry Chapman Catt said, we're two votes short, we're two votes short. And they didn't know how they were gonna win. As they were leaving the room that night, somebody said, is there anything else we can do? And Kerry Chapman Catt said, yes, we can pray. And so they did. The next morning, by the Nashville police estimates, there were 40,000 people in the streets of Nashville from the Hermitage to the Capitol awaiting the vote. Joe Hanover, uh, wearing a, a yellow rose, left the Hermitage Hotel, made his way, you know, probably had cheers and jeers. The cheers from the yellow rose wearing crowd, the jeers from the red rose, and red rose people in the crowd, 
there were a few legislators there too. I think this is amusing. There were reports at the time, there were a few legislators that actually had little red, uh, excuse me, red and yellow roses combined boot, boutonnieres. So they were kind of, you know, kind of kind of straddled the floor and fence until the last uh, minute. They went to the Capitol. Joe Hanover got up and said, the hour has come. Uh, this is over. I move that we table the resolution to pass the 19th Amendment. We know what, in parliamentary procedure, what that means. It meant to kill it. Some of them disingenuously argued, Jossie, that they weren't trying to kill it. They were just going to give the voters that fall the opportunity to tell them wh whether they wanted um, uh, the legislators to vote for women's suffrage. That was a disingenuous argument because they knew, first of all, it's going to be male voters. And second, they knew if it stopped there, it was over for the, for the foreseeable future for a long time. They killed it there. Joe Hanover begged for more time. He didn't succeed. And then they began to have the vote on the motion to table. There was a legislator from Yorkville, Tennessee named Banks Turner. Banks Turner uh, wore a, a red rose. He was regarded by everyone as, as an ante. And but when it came time to vote on the motion to table, Everyone's surprised, especially Seth Walker's surprised. Uh, Banks Turner voted no. He voted against the motion to table. Uh, and when the votes then were counted, it was a tie. It was a 48-48 tie uh, to, to table. Seth Walker was convinced that Banks just made a mistake, you know, just confused. He walked down to Banks' desk at the Florida legislature, put his hand on his shoulders, called for another vote. They voted again. Banks Turner voted no the motion to the table once again. Uh, so to the surprise of everyone, they hadn't killed it. But you see, Seth Walker knew he still had the votes. He had the votes. So at that time, he moved to the resolution, the vote on the resolution. And they began to vote again. This time, very early on, the name of Harry Byrne, who, who Jossie mentioned earlier, Harry Byrne, from Nyota, Tennessee, a radio telegraph or from Nyota, Tennessee, wearing a red rose. And Harry Byrne then surprised Seth Walker for the second time that day, surprised everybody, because wearing a red rose, he voted for the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Seth Walker was still convinced that, you know, he and like Banks Turner, they just got confused. I don't know what's going on here. We thought he still had the votes. And then the votes went on. Banks Turner not only voted and not only voted uh, no on the motion to uh, kill the amendment, but then he voted yes. And when the votes were counted, to the surprise, to the gasp in the audience, the cheering yellow rose wearing uh, women in the gallery, the vote was 49 to 47 to pass the 19th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Joe Hanover was sworn uh, 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 like, a, like a pitcher who had thrown a no-hitter, uh, there was a swarm around Harry Burns, a lot of concern about his safety. Seth Walker was still convinced that it had just been a mistake. Seth Walker uh, then made another move, a calculated parliamentary move. He then announced, I'm changing my vote to I. Now, why did he do that? Again, if you've got some parliamentary experience, you know that if you're going to move to reconsider something, you have to be on the winning side to move to reconsider. So he was determined there was going to be another vote the next day to reconsider. It's going to kill it. So he cast the 50th vote. Now, here was the mistake he made. In casting the 50th vote, he had assured a parliamentary majority for it, much less uh, likely to survive a legal challenge. He had cast the 50th vote. But Seth Walker wasn't through with the fight. That night, uh, he and uh, other aunties uh, summoned uh, Joe Hanover and uh, Harry Byrne uh, to a meeting and said, uh, they presented him with an affidavit. And said, look, the affidavits, we know you're bribed. Joe, we know you, you, paid, you paid Harry for his, I think, I think the term, they, the figure they, they alleged was $10,000. We know you bought it. Joe Hanover said, that's ridiculous. Harry Burns said, that's ridiculous. He said, well, we've got the affidavit. Well, they did have an affidavit. Uh, and it was signed by a witness. Uh, but the interesting thing is the notary who signed it, they talked to the notary. Uh, and she signed it saying that this is what was, had been said, was sworn to before her, but she was a sub, and she had also heard the conversation where the entire 
uh, subornation of perjury had, was taking place. The word got to reporters, to the, to the tennis stand, and the banner. And at that point, uh, any any effort to, for reconsideration by uh, by uh, the legislature was was defeated. The it's funny too. Uh, a number of the antis actually tried to they got on what they called the Red Rose Express and went down to Decatur, Alabama uh, that night to, to flee essentially, trying to kill a quorum. It didn't work. There were still enough votes for a quorum the next day, and the motion to reconsider died. Um, uh, there were still legal challenges, didn't work. Um, Carrie Chapman Cat uh, and, and a number of her sister suffs uh, got on a train to make the journey to Washington to see the Secretary of State sign this constitutional amendment into the Constitution of the United States. Uh, it was a circuitous route going from Nashville to Chattanooga to Atlanta, back up the seaboard. They arrived in Washington um, five hours after it had been signed, but they did go to the White House and thank Woodrow Wilson for his, his support. Uh, Jossie, can I tell what Joe did after that? And, and, and Please, well, after 1920, and yeah. I remember hearing him speak once, and he said it was treacherous leaving the legislature, mm -hmm. that he had to securitously hide to, upon leaving for, yeah. he was afraid for his life. There was concern about his safety, there was concern about Harry Burns' uh, safety uh, as well. But Joe, after, after the motion to reconsider failed, um, uh, Joe went back to Memphis and never returned to the legislature, did not run for re-election in 1920. Uh, uh, when uh, Esther went to the polls at the Lester School in November of 1920, she cast her first vote for president of the United States. And for other office holders, she didn't get to vote for her son because he wasn't on the ballot. Uh, never appeared on a ballot again the rest of his life. He had a remarkable life of service, uh, practiced law for uh, about the next uh, 60 years, married uh, uh, Jean Kaplan. Uh, she was a, I know a lot of great stories from Eddie and others in the family about, about her. She was a remarkable uh, woman, a highly spirited woman as spirited as Joe. He met his match there. They, uh, they raised thoroughbred horses out in, in, uh, East, in, out in Germantown, uh, ran the horses in uh, 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 one horse named Danny T. He named his horses after his friends. One horse named Danny T won the Arkansas Derby. Danny T was named after Joe's good friend, Danny Thomas, the founder of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. He was very active in efforts to get uh, other uh, uh, displaced uh, people out of Poland and uh, <coughs> in, in, both during World War II and, and afterwards. Uh, I was doing a uh, I was doing a, a, a virtual talk with a group in Boston the other night and appearing on the chat, uh, the chat discussion was a note from a gentleman in Boston. He said, uh, 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 Joe Hanover got my grandfather out of Poland, out of Nazi dominated Poland. He said, so I'm watching you tonight because of Joe Hanover, because he got my grandfather here. Very moving, wonderful, wonderful uh, story. So Joe didn't run for office again, but uh, but uh, he was very he was uh, head of the Port Authority in, in Memphis for the River Authority in Memphis for years. Uh, very public spirited and quite a remarkable life that he led. I um, have uh, uh, an acquaintance named Elaine Weiss, who has written a book that you have done such a great job in narrating the drama of the story, and she, her whole book is on that legislative session. And uh, it's called The Woman's Hour, and she has published a children's version. And on rereading yours for today, it is totally appropriate for kids to read and, and, and should be done. But your title is fascinating. <clears throat> the Unfinished Business of Democracy. So what does Joe's life and his story, what could it mean for us today? I really appreciate that, uh, Josie. I really do, because to me, this isn't just history. You know, it, it's remarkable. I, I, I think it's an incredible story. I, I think it's so powerful that it was an immigrant who really uh, appreciated democracy. Uh, it, was, it was so wonderful to him, and it's something we should never take for granted. He didn't take it for granted. Um, and uh, um, and uh, Josie mentioned the little little subtitle or second line is Joseph Hanover, the unfinished business of democracy. Later in his life, uh, he was being interviewed and, and he 
he was asked the question, well, you, you asked why can't mother vote? Did you eventually find the answer to that, that question? And he said, uh, yes, um, you know, went, became a lawyer, practiced law, learned more about the rule of law, went to the legislature, was involved in the fight. He said, and at some point I realized that democracy is a work in progress. There was in the summer of 1920, unfinished work that we had to address. And Joe Hanover believed all the way through the, the Voting Rights Act, which he, was, he lived to see all these, these, through these things, that, uh, that the vote was just, the, to me, it was, the, it was the key to democracy. He, he was, you know, it was interesting. He was, he, was, he, was, he was not extremely liberal. He was conservative in, in many ways, when conservative meant something that, uh, different than what it means now. And he really, he was conservative about the rule of law and about, about the vote. And, um, and I, 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 I just think the important, what is it? Somebody, I've heard somebody say recently that, that history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme a lot, you know? And um, uh, obviously now, the battle for the vote's still going on. It's still going on. Suppression. And, uh, and uh, so, so I, do, I really think that the great part of this story that I hope people will read, first of all, I hope people will appreciate Joe Hanover because everybody knows the Harry Byrne story. And I love the Harry Byrne story too. The Harry Byrne note from his mama. Oh, I, I, did, I, did I omit that? Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I omitted a big part of this story. I apologize. The, the, what, what, what Banks Turner and uh, Harry Byrne's vote uh, uh, when, they, when, they, when they were interviewed by reporters the, the day after the surprise vote, uh, of course, people want to know why when you're wearing red roses, did you, did you vote for suffrage? Banks Turner's story is that on the morning of the uh, of, of the vote, uh, the governor of Tennessee called him in his office. Uh, had Banks Turner had no idea why he was being called in there, but uh, he was going to have a phone call. The governor's going to have a phone call with the governor of Ohio, who was the Democratic nominee for gut for president of the United States. And Banks Turner sat there and listened to this half of the conversation, where where he's hearing the governor of Ohio uh, from what he, he's interpreting that what uh, the governor of Tennessee is saying. The governor of Ohio is begging, you got to pass this thing. There are millions of potential votes here this fall. And, and Governor Roberts, looking directly at Banks Turner on the phone, says, uh, the man who's going to get this passed today is sitting across from me. And, that's, and that moment convinced <laughs> uh, Banks Turner to change his vote. Now, the Harry Byrne story, which a lot of you know, because it's, it's, it's a great story. It's a great story. Um, uh, turns out he was wearing a red rose. Under the red rose in his pocket was a note from Phoebe. Phoebe Burns, his mother, in the Ode of Tennessee, and Phoebe Burns, Phoebe said in the note, let's see, I've got the exact note in here somewhere. I think I do. <laughs> be a good boy. <laughs> All right, be a good boy. Dear son, hurrah, and vote for suffrage, and don't keep them in doubt. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. Lots of love, Mama. And Harry Byrne uh, got a great spot in history because he said, I always do what my mother asked me to do. It's a great story. So people know the Harry Byrne story and it's a wonderful story. But again, I just want to say this is not taking anything away from Harry Burns. Great story. But that vote wouldn't even have taken place. It would have without. been without Joe Hanover. Joe Hanover kept it alive and, uh, and he's an unsung hero. And we need to share that uh, there's going to be two... Uh, uh, community um, acknowledgement of this role. First of all, I think Paula, well, first of all, Paula Casey has chaired the Equality Trailblazers Monument in downtown Memphis on the river view of the law school. And Joe Hanover has a bust of him that's going to be, oh, that's great, that is going to be on this monument. And his home on Broad, uh, where the restaurant is, is going to have a historical marker from, from the Heritage Trail. So finally, finally, Joe Hanover is going to get the public acknowledgement and appreciation that he, he deserves for this. Where can we get your book, Joe? Uh, Bill, <laughs> I called you Joe. You've come Joe to me. I'm kind of flattered that you call me Joe. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, 
I spent so much time with Eddie. I hope Eddie's still on the line with Eddie Kaplan. You know, I, I, he would refer to Uncle Joe this and Uncle Joe that. And I started calling Joe Hanover Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember saying one time to Eddie, I said, well, what, what would Uncle Joe say about such and such? You know, he says, let me tell you, he's the third person I've written a biography about. And I never met Joe Hanover. I did meet Senator Baker and I did meet Coach Summit. But I'm going to tell you something. One of the joys of writing a biography about someone is you really get to know someone. Now, I got to know Joe. Through, uh, uh, through Eddie, through uh, other members of the Hanover family, with so many of them. And I got to know Joe from letters that Micah Greenstein and Jennifer Cole, that, that they, they, shared, they shared with me. And so it's great. Now, to answer your question, thanks for letting me promote this. <laughs> it is available, of course, at uh, two wonderful independent bookstores we have in Memphis, at Burks and at Novel. Um, it's... Uh, uh, although I prefer you go uh, uh, to the bookstore, order it from the bookstore. Of course, it's available on Amazon site and Barnes and Noble. Um, now, if you want me to sign you a copy and send you a copy directly, uh, you can just send me an email. Are you ready for this? W Haltom, W H A L T O M at Comcast.net. W Haltom at Comcast.net. And I'll be happy to get you a copy. Uh, that. And you have become a Jewish Book Council author, uh, and congratulations on that, and tell us about your experience and where you've been going to Jewish book fairs virtually. Well, uh, first of all, again, I have to thank Jossie uh, for this. When I started working on the book, Jossie told me about the Jewish Book Council, uh, and she said, you really need to, 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 to get the book to them. Jossie had done it. It's a wonderful group based out of New York uh, every year. Uh, in the spring, they, 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 they invite a number of writers who write books of, of interest to people of the Jewish faith. And, uh, and they give us, you ready for this? You, you can hear, I, I'm talking like a magpie. But for the Jewish Book Council, we have two minutes apiece, right, Jossie? Two minutes, two minutes apiece. If you, believe I, I, you mean, if you can believe I, I, I limited myself to two minutes on a Zoom last May, I did. And that Zoom was watched by literally a couple hundred uh, uh, leaders of groups like the JCC um, around the country, and uh, and then uh, uh, I got a number of invitations. I think uh, twelve by last count. I've spoken to groups here: Dallas, Philadelphia, uh, New Jersey, Boston. It's great fun. It's great fun, and, and really, really a privilege to to do this. So I'm very appreciative of that. Is before we turn it open to the audience for questions, is there anything else I should have asked you? <laughs> no, I really appreciate the last question about what it what it means now, what this history means now, because I think it's just a, I think it's highly relevant. I really, I really do. Marcy, do we have uh, some questions? I know we had a sweet we statement did. from Rabbi Greenstein. We did, yes. Um, thank you both so much for doing this. This story is certainly a treasure, um, as Rabbi Greenstein said, and. And as we've heard, this is a story that's not just relevant locally, but it's relevant all around our country right now. Um, of course, uh, we've got an election coming up. So if you haven't voted, make sure to do that. Early voting has started. I think early voting ends on Thursday, the 29th. So if you don't get to vote by Thursday, you got to go November 3rd. Um, let's see. We have a question. Let's see. From Mimi. Did Joe's mother ever get to vote? Yes. Uh, she cast her first vote in November of 1920, um, and uh, I, I can't really tell you for sure, but I suspect maybe Eddie and some family members would know. But I, I don't think she missed any votes after that. I really. What a I, proud I, moment! A proud, a proud moment. Yes, she I did. Think I'll wear a yellow flower every time I go to vote from now on. There you go. That's I like nice that. I like that, Marcy. That's a nice touch. I'll have to remember that. What other questions do we have? That's the one that, that has come through in the chat. If you have a question, please submit it in the chat. It's a little hard for us to see everybody if you're raising your hand. So um, the way that we're going to do this is just by looking at the chat. That button is at the bottom of your screen. So type in your questions. And um, while we wait, I am just going to reiterate that you can get the book at Novel and at Burks. And Bill is willing to sign books for you. I threw his uh, email address up in the chat for you, whaltum at comcast.net. Um, so take a look there if you missed it. Let's see. Uh, where did the idea of roses come from? 
Uh -oh. That is our next question in the chat. Jossie, do you know the answer to that question? I know about other Wars of the Roses, but. No, I don't know why that became uh, the uh, symbol. Well, and I, I can't directly, I apologize. It's a great question. And I, and I Paula may know, we'll ask Paula. Paula. Yeah, but I will tell you this, uh, there's, a, there's a history of Wars of the Roses in, in Tennessee. Uh, one of the most interesting War of the Roses battle was the, uh, was the race for governor uh, between uh, the Taylor brothers uh, back in, I think it was 1888 and, and uh, 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 Robert Taylor and, uh, oh, Paula's got, Susan B. Anthony's mother liked, Paula's got something up there. I can't read the bottom of it. What's it say? Yellow roses. You like yellow roses? Yeah, Susan B. Anthony's mother liked yellow roses. It started in Kansas with the sunflower. Yellow was for the crown of enlightenment. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Paula. Paula, listen, Paula, Paula and Jossie are my two favorite subs. There are there are 21st century subs. So I'm not surprised anything. Are you know. wearing white um, intentionally today? Oh, this is uh well, uh, you know, the colors of uh, of, 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 of the uh, seersucker movement were were purple and, and yellow and and white. And some of y'all know, some of you that know me know I'm, I'm kind of a, a seersucker aficionado. And, uh, and wrote so a book on it. I wrote a book. I wrote I wrote the book on seersucker because there are no other books on seersuckers. I wrote the book on seersucker, but so I'm wearing my white uh, my white seersucker uh, today, uh, rather because because yeah, the white's very much part of the color. But I was going to mention, you know, there was another War of the Roses back in the late 19th century where the Taylor brothers uh, ran for governor of Tennessee, uh, Alf Taylor versus Robert Taylor. One ran as a Democrat, one ran as a Republican. And one wore a yellow rose, one wore a red rose, and, and the national media referred to the War of the Roses then. Now, now you probably think, well, you know, it wouldn't be fair just to have two brothers run and have no other candidate. Well, there was a third candidate in that race that year. Reverend Nathaniel Taylor, their father, ran on the prohibition ticket. So they did have a choice between three Taylors. <laughs> and they both ended up serving at different times. But that's another story for another book. They both got, they obviously both didn't win that election, but they both got elected governor at different times. Bill, do you have a new project in the works? Uh, yes, thank you for asking. I, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, I am, I'm trying to finish another book, a very Memphis-oriented book. Um, and the working title of the book is The Wish Building. The Wish Building is about the famous Sears Crosstown uh, building, which is now Crosstown Concourse. And I'm writing a book. You know, the reason it's called The Wish Building is the Sears and Robot Catalog was called The Wish Book, as you know. And uh, I'm writing the story of this iconic building, which uh, uh, for uh, 90 years, over 90 years, has been emblematic of Memphis in good times and tough times, and now an incredible renaissance of the place. You know, they, Sears, Sears built it in 1927 as the uh, distribution center for Sears in the Southeast United States, before Amazon.com, before FedEx, it was Sears at Crosstown that was distributed. You ordered something out of the catalog in the Southeast United States, there were a thousand people uh, on floors three through 12 of the Sears Crosstown building that were filling those orders and shipping out those orders. And then of course, as we all know, they went like gangbusters until about uh, the 1980s, Walmart and Target and other groups brought them down. Uh, and for, for from 19, 1993 to about 2017, that building was shuttered and then an incredible combination of Todd Richardson and Staley Cates and Scott Morris and some others got it reopened to Todd to uh, Crosstown Concourse, which it is today. So I, I, that's a work in progress. And thank you for asking, Jossie. I, you know, you can tell I love telling stories. So I've told a story about uh, about uh, Joe. I told a story about a great, uh, courageous uh, uh, feminist basketball coach and Pat, a great story about the last real practitioner of civility <laughs> politics, Howard Baker. Now I'm going to tell a story about a building. And I think it's a, I think it's a, it's of course they're, they're heroes in that story too. Todd Richardson, real visionary and, and Scott and it just and Staley, great, great folks. Well, we have time for one more question. Um, it says, this is for Mimi. It says my, my favorite book was maybe the other side was right. The civility of Howard Baker. Have we lost the ability to be civil in politics? That is from Mimi. Oh, thank you, Mimi. Yeah, it's a, uh, well, that's, that's a, that's an important topic. You know, it, it uh, yeah, uh, Senator Baker, you know, was a Republican. 
Uh, he was he claimed to be a conservative, even though he was the author, along with Ed Muskie, of the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts of 1970, because he said as a conservative, he believed in conservation. He said that's what a conservative <laughs> believe in, you know. Uh, and he had a mantra. Uh, he, he said, I'm a conservative. I'm a Republican. Uh, I believe in limited government. Uh, but I also, my father used to tell me when I was a boy, Howard, always remember the other fellow may be right. You got to listen to people and, and, and work with people. Unfortunately, now, Mimi, I think uh, a lot of people think of civility as weakness, just being pushed around. Civility is great strength. And I, I think Joe Hanover was civil. I think, I think when he made a speech like we all crossed the seas together, he didn't get up and say, you bunch of racists, you bunch of idiots or whatever. He was, he was appealing to their patriotism. He said, look what we have in common. Not we have different, you know, this is our chance to, to, to continue this voyage uh, together. So I think his story is a story of <laughs> real strength in, 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 in civility. What future projects does the historical society, what's its next program? And Marcy, what, what in your realm is going to be next? Well, I can only speak for the JCC and then I'll turn it over to Mimi to answer the question about the Jewish Historical Society. Um, we have started a community read program. So if you're not familiar, um, part of this, this year's Lit Fest Live in Your Living Room series, um, we have a set of community reads where either with your book club or on your own or with your friends or your family, however you're going to do it, we're all reading the same few books together and then we get to log on and, and meet the author and ask questions about the book and, and learn about the, the writing process. And the first community read event is on Thursday, the 29th, the last day of early voting. Mm -hmm. um, had to slide that in there again. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, for, for letting me do that. And um, her name is Meg Waite Clayton and she's a New York Times bestselling author, but the community read book, my, my book club just finished it, is called The Last Train to London. It's really good, highly recommend it. Whether you've read it or not, join us on Thursday. It's a free program, um, but you still have to register for the link and uh, you can read the book afterward too. But these community reads are great. They're great for community building. You can talk to other people about what you're reading and it's really, it's been, it's been great. Um, Mimi, I'm going to add you up here and you can tell everybody what's coming next for Jewish Historical Society. I think you're muted. There you are. Oh, there I am. Okay. Thanks, Marcy. And thanks. Thanks for asking. Our next program coming up is on November 15th. And uh, if you're a member and on our mailing list, you should be getting a postcard about it this week. Um, Again, we're staying with books and we're staying in the South. We have uh, author Marjorie Kirstein, who has written a really fascinating book. I just got it the other day and I haven't started reading it yet. And I can't wait to. It's about <laughs> Clarksdale, Mississippi, and it's called The Merchants on Issaquina Street, Avenue of the Blues in Mississippi. And I think that ought to be fascinating. She talks about not only how, how the Jews have played such a, a role in these uh, southern small towns, but how they really were a melting pot. Um, then the, we're taking a little bit of a break in December and our next program in January, uh, we will be virtually visiting the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience in New Orleans, which they had hoped would open this year, but won't be open until sometime next year. Um, I don't have that exact date. It'll be a Sunday afternoon. Um, you'll see it in the save the date that'll come on the Marstein card, but we'll also be doing some publicity for that. And we'll have the executive director of the museum will talk about and tour us, I hope a little bit through the museum. So we're really excited about that and hope to have more projects as we come into the spring. It looks like we may have to be virtual for quite a while yet. So, well, thank you so much, everybody. Bill, do you have thank one you. thing you want to end with? I, I, yeah, could I just uh, talk about books? First of all, if you don't have a copy, <laughs> don't have a copy. I, I, love the, I love the title, Jossie, Southern Jewish American Princess and Civil Rights Activist. That's fabulous. And, and also- Maybe we Paula, need to make a program out of that. There you go. Oh, and Paula, you. you got a copy of the Perfect 36 to hold up the Perfect 36 behind you there? There you go. 
This, this should be a part of the Tennessee Suffrage Library. Burberry 36, Jossie, and, and, uh, and uh, Why Can't Mother Vote? Because this is a beautiful, beautiful book. And, and, and the perfect Thank 36 you. is incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Bill. See you soon. Thank you to the Historical Society. Thank you, Thank Bill. you to the JCC. Great to see everybody. Thank you. Stay well. Thanks, Bye-bye.